morning, church. Good morning, church. Amen. Glad to see you on this lovely rainy Sunday. Also a special welcome to people joining us on, on the live stream. We are glad that we could gather today to carry on in our journey through, through the scriptures. And even as we are singing about Christ and how worthy he is, today even as we go through the message and we learn more about Christ as he nears his great sacrifice on the cross, may our hearts be opened and may our hearts be reminded of what it is that Christ actually gave up, what it is he suffered, what it is he went through um, on our behalf and for our sake. Amen? Amen. Today, we will carry on through our series in Building a Firm Foundation, and we'll be looking at the betrayal of Jesus today. That is the, the passage of Scripture that we will be going through, and this is indeed a part of Scripture that many more people tend to know what it's about, because it has been, it's been famous, it's been on movies, it's been all throughout, uh, even people who, do not, who aren't practicing Christians know a bit about the betrayal of Christ. Now, to situate ourselves where we are, Jesus at this point is in Jerusalem. And he is in Jerusalem and nearing the climax of his ministry and purpose here on the earth. As he's in Jerusalem, Jesus goes about teaching and there's a, a crowd that follows him. Um, however, there are people as well who don't fully understand what, what Christ is about. And in this period in his ministry, as Jesus teaches, and he teaches on things like eternal life, which is what uh, Sode was talking about last week, he also begins to teach on eternal things to his disciples. Because nearing the end of his life, he begins to spend more time with the 12 people that walked with him for the three years. And he begins to tell them about judgment. He begins to tell them about signs of the end. He begins to tell them about his death and resurrection. And all the while, as Jesus is in Jerusalem, the influential and religious leaders are actively trying to kill him. They are actively plotting on a way that they can actually get Jesus off the scene. And, and just before Passover which is a Jewish feast, Jesus once again reminds his disciples that he is about to die. He has been doing this, and his disciples have either been resisting or failing to understand, but we will see in our text today that Jesus reminds his disciples that he's about to get killed. And he also reminds them, because in two other occasions in the book of Matthew, in Matthew 17, 22, and Matthew 20, verse 18, Jesus highlights that one of the ways or one of the things that will happen when he is about to die is that he's going to be betrayed. That his death will come by way of betrayal. And so in the text today, we'll see Christ remind his disciples that he is going to get betrayed. Now, I think we all know betrayal to one degree or another in our lives because it's, a com it's common to the human condition. And what makes betrayal all the more bitter is the fact that the impact of, what the, of the wrong that someone has done to you is amplified by the fact that it's done by someone who is close to you. So not only are you having to deal with whatever has been done to you or said about you, but you're also having to deal with a violation of the assumed loyalty you had to an individual and in a relationship or a group of people. And so, the pain tends to be twofold. And for betrayal, it cuts much deeper, and the pain tends to linger on longer than usual. And in our journey through Scripture this year, we have seen that the story of Scripture is no stranger to betrayal. There are many betrayal stories in the Bible. Abraham kicked out Hagar, who was his wife's servant, but also the mother of his son. Jacob betrayed his brother Esau for his birthright. Joseph was sold into slavery by his siblings. Delilah betrayed Samson. 
David betrayed his friend Uriah by stealing his wife and eventually murdering him. Absalom betrayed his father David by trying to kill him and take his throne. Goma betrayed her husband Hosea by, after being married, going back into prostitution. And these are just a few of the betrayal stories that we see all throughout the, all throughout the narrative of scripture. And I don't believe that these stories are given for our entertainment. Because it seems in today's culture, whenever you watch a drama and there's betrayal, it just makes it all the more entertaining. But those stories in scripture are not given to us for our entertainment. But instead, I believe that these stories were given to us as evidence to, industry, to illustrate to us that betrayal is baked into the human condition. It is exhibited and experienced all throughout the ages and it is exhibited and experienced in our lives today. And to trace its origins, we would need to go back to the Garden of Eden because it is then where Adam violated his loyalty to God. And when Adam violated his loyalty to God, the seed was planted when man fell and encoded into the DNA of humanity is this tendency for us to betray those closest to us. And as Christ walked this earth as a man, part of his human experience here on earth was to go through a betrayal in all of its bitter glory. And we'll see that in our text today. Matthew 26 verse 1 to 4 says, And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days it's the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled to, and this is a separate scene, so if you're watching a movie, just know that there's a cut in what Jesus says, and there's a shift into another scene in verse 3. And in verse 3 it says, Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtly, by subtlety and kill him. So even as Jesus is prophesying to his disciples, what's happening behind the scenes in the palace of the high priest is that they are congregating to figure out a way in which they can kill Jesus subtly. Now, if I'm to ask who is the person who betrayed Jesus, I'm, I'm asking the question, who betrayed Jesus? He has a name, we all know his name. We can't, I can't hear you. Judas, exactly. Judas is the one who betrayed Jesus, and it's no secret. But when Jesus was speaking, it was not apparent to the disciples who the betrayer was. We know the end of the story, but they didn't as they were going through it. And the first point I'd like to observe in this story is Judas, Judas's, rather, Judas's idolatry. Now, because of this, fame, this story being so famous, whenever we hear Judas, we already put him in the bucket of a betrayer of Jesus, someone who can't be trusted, someone who deserved to die. And owing to the fame of his name, uh, we already have mental allowance for what Judas is going to do in Scripture. Because we've heard this story so many times, we know that, okay, even whenever we see his name come onto the scene, we know that, oh, that's the guy, that's the guy who's going to betray Jesus. His name is a metaphor for the betrayal. Even jokingly in our conversations, we may sometimes say, ah, that one is a Judas because of something that they did to you. It, 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 it becomes synonymous with betrayal in our, even in our colloquial talk in our day and age because this story is so famous. What I found as well quite interesting when I googled this name is that not many people are named Judas and not many parents are willing to name their children Judas. Um, in fact, in the States, on average, every year about 15 people, less than 20 people are named Judas and to me that's very surprising. However, it's a very, 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 very small percentage of the millions of people born um, every year in the United States. Now, all that being said, I want us to not forget that Judas is not just the famous 
worldwide uh, betrayer. However, he was an apostle. Because when Jesus, I mean, when Judas comes onto the scene, he comes onto the scene as a follower of Christ. He is a servant. He was the treasurer for their ministry, and he was a follower of Christ. Of Christ. Out of the multitudes, he was one of the 12 that Christ handpicked. And I don't think when Christ was picking his disciples, he was looking for 11 disciples and one rebel. When he put out the job post, he didn't say, I'm looking for 11 disciples and one betrayer. That was not what Jesus did when he initiated his relationship with these people who became his family. But when Jesus handpicked the 12, he recruited them, he nurtured them, he empowered them, he led them, and most importantly, he loved the 12. They were his family, and his heart was for them all. And Judas had a ministry amongst the elect. Christ always knew that one among those who were close to him would shift allegiances. And not only did he know one of them would betray him, he knew that it was Judas. However, Christ's foreknowledge did not negate the characteristics that made Judas a suitable disciple. Because he, the criteria for discipleship was standard and Judas met all of those. And he was a follower of Christ. Unfortunately, however, if we examine the life of Judas, we will see that Judas only had part-time loyalty to Christ and his ministry. And the reason why I say it's part-time is because we cannot say that Judas from day one planned to betray Jesus. When he stepped onto the scene for whatever motives and plans and purposes, it wasn't to betray his master. I know this because as well as a disciple, it was not easy to live that kind of life. The disciples left everything that they had to follow Christ. And Judas was one of the people who exhibited a conviction and a loyalty to Christ above average for him to be committed or rather brought into the close circle of Christ. Many people had the opportunity to be a disciple of Christ and many deserted, in fact, a majority deserted Christ because it was not an easy thing. Whether what he was saying was difficult or what he was doing was difficult or the lifestyle that they were living was difficult, Judas was one of the people who exhibited a loyalty and a, uh, an allegiance rather or rather a commitment to the ministry of Christ. So we cannot say that he had a complete lack of loyalty to Christ. However, the issue was that his partial loyalty is his, his loyalty, rather, was partial in the fact that it was not fully centered on what Christ was focused on. And we'll see that his partial loyalty eventually degenerated into outright betrayal of our master. And Judas's loyalties were tainted, and in the scriptures we get to learn that his heart was accommodating a hidden idol, and that hidden idol was a love for money. In John 12, verse 4 to 6, it says, But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, and just for context, this is when a lady with a very expensive perfume comes into where Jesus is, and what she does is she breaks that perfume and spends it all on Christ. Now, this was Judas's response when she did that because it was very expensive perfume. And verse 5 says, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. So here we get a glimpse into Judas's hidden idol in his heart, and he had a love for money. And him being treasurer from time to time, he would help himself to whatever was in the ministry's finances. In Judas's heart, though he was loyal to the ministry 100% of the time, and six days out of a week, he would be serving God. On the seventh day, money would come into his heart and command him to do something. And what Judas would do is he would yield by helping himself to whatever was in the basket. And then, 
the next day will come and Judas will carry on in his ministry, walking in power, seeing miracles happen, seeing Christ deliver them from storms. But then again, on another day, that hidden idol will come and take command of his heart and he would yield and obey to it by helping himself to more of the ministry's finances. The idol that he kept and he nurtured in his heart was an idol that didn't mind being worshipped or ruled, ruling part-time. Or rather, let me put it in another way, idols in our hearts don't mind ruling part-time. Because Judas wasn't stealing every day. His love for money wasn't ruling his actions every day. But he made an allowance in his heart and he had a hidden idol and a love for money that from time to time would occasion itself in the behavior that he exhibited. And idols do not mind the fact that you only yield to them from time to time. Idols are comfortable that way and they're comfortable working their way to the top of your life. And they command only when necessary and the takeover is quite slow. In Judas's life, we see that even from the outside looking in, no one could dispute that he was a disciple and no one could dispute that he was loyal to the ministry of Christ. But hidden in the background, silently in the background, was a cultivation of a love that he should not have had, a love for money. And that love for money, we'll see, actually grew and degenerated into what led to his betrayal or Christ's betrayal. In here we see that there's a lesson. And the lesson is, like Judas, you can tick all the criteria for apostleship. You can tick all the criteria for a disciple. And from the outside looking in, people can say that is a genuine follower of Christ. However, to us as believers, there is need for us to guard our hearts with all diligence because in Judas's life, we can see that our heart can be driven by motives of hidden idols. In Judas's life, we have an example of someone who was a follower of Christ but also was driven by a hidden idol in his heart. And we may be playing host to idols that only rule part-time in our lives. Whether it's pride, whether it's anger, whether it's ambition, whether it's your career, whether it's money like Judas. It could be made a plethora of things that we serve. It could be lust. Whatever it may be, they are a host of idols that can rule our hearts part-time and affect our full devotion to Christ. And all these idols have the ability to receive part-time worship from you, and from, I, from you and I. And it is this kind of fragmented loyalty that made Judas a prime candidate for the enemy's work. It was a fragmented loyalty in his heart that the, event, the enemy eventually exploited in order to carry out his plans and his purposes in bringing Christ down. Matthew 26, verse 14 to 16 says, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him thirty pieces of silver, so from that time he sought an opportunity to betray him. I want us here to note the progression. Because on this day, Judas's idol did not command him to steal from the offering basket. On this day, Judas's idol didn't say, go and just take the money from what the guys gave this past week. What we see is that his idol commanded him to trek into the courts of the high priest to go to the very place where the people were consulting on how they could kill Christ. And here in John, in your own time, please may you read John 11, verse 45 to 57. John 11, verse 45 to 57 
reveals just how much the high priests were struggling to get Christ. They were struggling in their strategy, and as they were struggling in their strategy, Judas strolls in wanting to cut a deal with them. Judas essentially was their answer, or rather an answer to their prayer, because they were not able to properly figure out a way to trap Christ. Now, one thing I want us to note here in in Matthew 26 is notice the first words that came out of Judas' mouth. The first words that came out of his mouth were, what will you give me? This is no longer subtle, and his part-time idol is no longer acting behind the scenes in a silent manner. Right now, his love for money is loud and it's clear. His love for money is being displayed when the high priest, when he walks himself to the high priest and says, what will you give me? On this day, when Judas accommodated his love for money, it drove him to do something more overt or more clear in opposition to Christ. We see here that the idol that he carried in his heart on this day was speaking loud and clear. It was very clear to us who Judas was serving when he went to the high priest. He was serving the idol in his heart, and that was a love for money. What will you give me, he asked the the high priest. What he had cultivated, what Judas had cultivated, was now bearing fruit. What he was doing silently in the background was now loud and clear in front of the chief priests. And what he was doing was he was asking for a price. He was asking for a price for him to betray his master. This is not where Judas started. Judas started by helping himself every other Sunday to the offering basket. But we see that the cultivation of the idol led to a natural progression which drove him into the chief priest's court to demand, what will you give me? Judas didn't fall into temptation here. Judas was driven by the very thing that he cultivated in his heart. The, the, The high priest did not appeal to Judas or send him a letter. Judas himself used his legs and mobilized himself to go and make this offer. Now, something that I want to note is that there is a clear progression in the heart of Judas of the idol that is on his heart and operating in his life. And I want to highlight this progression further by looking at John 13, verse 25 to 27. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, and this is John talking to Jesus, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. This was Jesus addressing Judas, fully aware that now Satan had possessed him to carry out what he needed to carry out. On this particular day, it wasn't the influence for his love of money that was prompting Judas. We see that at the Passover itself, it was not him trying to cut a deal with someone to get the best money deal. But what we see is that Satan himself took control to execute his scheme to end Jesus' life. Now, something that I need for us to understand is that idolatry fundamentally comes from a spirit of rebellion, rebellion against God. And Satan is the chief and principal overlord over all rebellion and over all insubordination. And any idol that we entertain or any wayward desire that we indulge in our hearts, in essence, is linked to the evil one. He is the chief overlord over all Way, um, over all idols and over all wayward desires that we have. And eventually the desires that we nurture within us will pave the way for the enemy to come and dominate our souls. The enemy 
dominated Judas' soul because he cultivated and grew a love for money in his heart that would occasionally drive him to steal from the offering basket, but more overtly would then drive him to go and ask for money for Christ. And here in, in, in the Passover feast, we see that Satan himself entered him through that open door. It was a door that Judas opened by his will, but it was a door that the enemy exploited to possess him to carry out his will. And when, the, when Satan comes in through an open door to dominate our souls, at that point, we are no longer able to fulfill our own cravings or desires. At that point, we fall into slavery. At that point, Judas was not walking according to his will. He was being driven by a spirit being that exploited the open door that he cultivated all throughout his life. Satan, the god of this age, will assert his control over the temporary seat of power that we've established for our personal idols. I'll say that again. Satan, the god of this age, will assert his control over the temporary seat of power we've established for our personal idols. And what I mean by that is that when we have open doors or hidden sin, and we see that in, in Judas's life, it becomes a potential for the enemy to eventually exploit. It may just be in one area of your life. You may be that one Christian in your workplace shining your light, but because you have a love for money in your heart, one day the enemy will make sure that maybe you cut a bribe in the office place that eventually leads, leads to you being caught, and now the whole office place is like, I thought he was a Christian, but he's actually been stealing money from the company. That impulse or that drive has come from a hidden idol that has been nurtured and that we think we can manage however we see in the life of Judas that that is what eventually overpowered, or rather that is what eventually opened the door for Satan to come and possess Judas and his actions. And at that point, we aren't in control, and at that point, the enemy uses you as a tool to carry out his plan. The plan was to kill Christ, and the enemy was finding a way through the chief priests to try and kill Christ, and he exploited an open door in Judas' heart and borrowed him to come and betray Jesus and provide the chief priest with the necessary intel to be able to capture Christ. And like every tool once used, it gets set aside. And we see that play out to its bitter end in the life of Judas. Because in Matthew 27, verse 3 to 4, this is after Christ has been condemned we see Judas now respond in a different way. He responds in a way that isn't in line with the way that he was responding before. And verse 3 says, Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Shortly after in Judas' life, when the enemy was done using him for whatever it is he wanted to achieve, Judas eventually felt remorse. He tried to give back the money. He tried to regain control of the situation that he wasn't in control of. And when I say he wasn't in control of it, I mean he was under the full influence of what he had cultivated in his heart. But after Christ has been um, uh, condemned, we see that whatever influence was on his heart is no longer there. He begins to feel remorse and he tries to undo what it is he did. However, without repentance, Judas ends his life. Now, in the scriptures, Judas's betrayal was prophesied long before Christ was born. However, Judas was an active participant the whole way. Judas exercised his will, consciously yielding his will to a, a hidden idol time after time after time over his life. And eventually, what he thought he could manage, 
eventually mastered him. And what we see is that Judas, through his idolatry, eventually opened up the door to the enemy to be used by him to betray his master. There's a famous quote I have up there which um, gets quoted quite often. And it says, sin, and I will also add the idolatry, will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. And we see this vividly play out in the life of Judas. Quickly, I would like to go over a guard against idolatry. Matthew 26, verse 21 to 22. Now they were eating, and he said, Surely I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? At first glance, this question may seem peculiar, or perhaps you may think that the disciples were trying to pretend to act like they don't know who is the person who will betray him. But the scripture says that they were exceedingly sorrowful. And in sorrow, they asked a genuine question, each of them. And they weren't pretending because they didn't accuse one another. They didn't point fingers or try and, and ascertain who it, amongst them would be the, the, the betrayer. Peter didn't think it was John, and John didn't think it was James, and James didn't point his finger to Thomas and say that maybe it's him. But each of them individually looked at Christ and asked, is it I? Am I the one who could potentially betray you? That is an important question. Because in asking that question, there is a humble acknowledgement that there exists a possibility that even after all this time of them following Jesus, there was a possibility that they could be the betrayer. They were asking a question that was genuine, and they were asking it to the Lord. They were asking, Lord, is it me? Tell me if I am the one. Is there anything in me that would betray you? Is there any way in me, if there's any idol, any appetite, any sin that would cause me to sell you off for gain? Lord, is it I?